Welcome to the Left of Straight Show, where we talk entertainment, music, books, foodies, and more each week with special guest interviews of interest to the LGBTQ community and our straight allies. Direct from the entertainment capital of Northeast Ohio. Northeast Ohio. Your host, Scott Fullerton, chats with some of your favorite entertainers, celebrities, newsmakers, and behind the scenes people across the country and around the world who make it all happen. So sit back, grab your favorite beverage, and let's start talking. straight show my interview series i'm your host as always scott fullerton and we have been celebrating pride month here on the left of straight show this fine june and i've been playing kind of old home week old home month actually with some of my all-time favorite guests over the last six months and today we are lucky mr stan zimmerman back in the house today the acclaimed writer producer director Sam's done, Sam's done so many great things uh, from television to plays to movies that uh, we would like to spend half this interview to talk about as a compliment. So let's go ahead and get him back onto the screen. Mr. Sam Zimmerman, how the heck are you? I've missed you, my friend. I've missed you too. Yes, it's so great to be back. Great to see your face again. So glad you're doing this again. And especially during Pride, we really need you out there to celebrate everything LGBTQ plus, and um, especially we need those allies out there. I've been talking a lot about that recently. That's, I feel like we need allies in this cause, and that's how we're gonna change the dialogue because right now it's been pretty frightening, uh, all the laws that have been passed. It's a scary climate out there between Tennessee and Oklahoma and Montana, and they're silencing Congress people. I mean, Zoe, from Montana, 11,000 people voted for her. And then a couple of guys decided they're not going to let her speak on the floor for the rest of her term. That's ridiculous. I don't understand how that is legal and why it hasn't gone to court yet. All of these. It needs to. Yeah. It's ridiculous. I don't understand. Uh, it's just there's so much stuff going on. That, as you say, we are going backwards. You've been such pioneering work, everything from your recent take on Diary of Dan, uh, Diary of Anne Frank to your um, Right Before I Go, which now is more prevalent than ever in a lot of areas in our LGBT life, really to just time, doing yeah. some of your um, older shows. I mean, Meet and Greet and Silver Foxes, which we're going to talk about, which is relatively new. You've been such uh, a great representative to the media that, like you said, we need more of that, not just in our community, but our allies. And uh, you've been having some great talkbacks after these places and speaking here, where are you finding these amazing people? Uh, for the Diary of Anne Frank, for people don't don't know, I put together a Latinx cast to play everybody in the attic to connect uh, with um, the child separation that happened with the last administration. And I've been doing the play since 2018. We just did two uh, engagements in January and uh, this past April at the Colony Theater in beautiful downtown Burbank. And we had the amazing... 92-year-old Holocaust survivor, Gabriella Karen, who uh, was our guest at the Talkback. We had some wonderful moderators like Jay Rodriguez, who's our gay icon from Queer Eye. And one night with Jay, we, you know, we got some really uh, interesting questions about what were we appropriating uh, by having Latinx actors play these characters, and I'm Jewish. And it, but it got into a really interesting discussion. The most important uh, talkbacks have been with students. We do a lot of student morning shows. And one kid got up, you know, one month ago and asked, what year did the war start? And we had to make the point to these kids, you have to remember, Hitler was elected. He didn't take over, he was elected. Think about that. And it didn't just start with the declaration of war. It started with words and othering of people. And that's what we're seeing now, the othering of the trans community. Don't say gay. Don't talk about or learn about uh, black history and the history of slavery in this country. So 
you know, I'm not saying it's exactly like the Holocaust, but there are a lot of parallels and we have to learn from them. Otherwise, you know, the saying is never again. So never again. So that's why I feel like presenting Anne Frank now has been almost more intense this past year. And, you know, because I'm so old, I remember like when Clinton was elected, we kind of thought like, okay, we're okay. Cool. This is going to be cool. And then, nope. And then, you know, Obama. All right, we got this. And like, nope. And not to name drop, but I have a feeling we will be. Uh, I one time was out to dinner after the Clinton thing. And um, I was to dinner with uh, Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner. And I'm like, help me, help me understand this. And she said something really important. She said, politics is like a pendulum. And it goes back and forth. And that's what helped me get through the last administration, knowing how extreme it was. And then now we're back right. to some sanity. And hopefully we won't swing back. But um, yeah, that's just, you know, one way to survive it. But still fighting. We still have to keep fighting, unfortunately. Well, yeah, and, it, and it's different now. I think one of the things that we have not done as a uh, small D democratic society and everything as well as the Republicans have is working on the state capitals. Because as you said, we've had two years now of a democratic legislation, uh, a democratic um, administration, but all these state houses are what's doing this with the governors like Ron DeSantis and Texas and Greg Abbott and everything that's happening. But then you look, at, Mich at, you look at Michigan and Michigan really pulled through. And I'm from Michigan, exactly. so I'm very proud. So it shows that you can do it. And unfortunately, we have to do have more people out there to prove that the elections aren't stolen, which is kind of crazy. That it's not only we have to win an election, we got to win it by, you know, exceedingly large numbers and having people wait in line hours and hours, which is insane. Um, but, you know, the fight is long, but it's it's still there and we have to get out there and keep it up, especially in the next couple of years. God bless you for your words, my friend, because you've been doing this battle for a long, long time. Um, let's get into some fun things. I mean, okay. we, we got to start with Golden Girls because that was one of your starts and claim to fame. You have been the golden mega guy lately between cruises and um, talkbacks and cons and everything in between. And I'm about um, to go for a wonderful uh, event in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, with the Golden Gaze, which is a, uh, a group of um, drag queens uh, doing uh, – wonderful original shows they're not doing you know just saying the lines from the shows they have original songs and 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 sketches and storylines and they're hysterical and they invited me down to Asheville and they're gonna be glamping it's a glamping weekend so they have these super cool old trailers you can stay in I, I think there's only a few left but there's also a wonderful hotel um you know with bathrooms that uh, you can also stay in so it's, it's a really cool weekend and and they asked me to come up with an event so I came up with this idea that, um, you know, it's very controversial, the Golden Palace. I don't know how you feel about it. I will, yeah. honestly, I did not see it enough, so I can't yeah. give a good opinion. I, I did see yeah. parts of it. I only saw two episodes. It wouldn't have been the sequel, what I would have done with B. Arthur. If they'd come to me and said, all right, B. Arthur's leaving. What can we do with the show? So that's what we're going to present to everyone coming there. So we're going to have kind of like a fun pitch session, people coming and pitching. Yeah what you would have done to the show. You know, would you have brought in a new character? Would that. you have gone to another venue? What, what would you have done? So it's going to be kind of fun, and then we'll all vote on which we think is, is the best idea. So, um, yeah, they get to pick the oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. That sounds amazing. I love that idea. That's great. Because yeah. like I said, I, re I remember vaguely the concept of Golden Palace, but I only saw two episodes, I think. Uh, you recently got back from your second uh, cruise, with uh, great pe with Chad and all the great people from Flip Phone Events, talk about that. I think Jim met with you again, of course. Jim, Jim wrote Colucci, one yes, of the definitive uh, books uh, on there. Uh, uh, Jim Colucci. It's so golden talk fans about that trip. How was it the second time around? As Golden Fans at Sea, you can go to it. They're doing a big cruise next year, next September, in Sicily. Picture it, Sicily. Yes. So uh, they're going um, on a cruise in it around Italy. I mean, how? What a great way to see that part of the area. Um, but this time was wonderful. Uh, the first time I did it in 2020, pre-COVID, we did two back-to-back -back cruises with like 900 and then 1,000 people. That was in 
beautifully intense. Um, and then this time was a smaller group, but a great group of people. I mean, we really, it's so fun. Everyone's so loving and accepting and we just, just laugh it up. And I finally wore a caftan. I braved it and I did it. Um, <laughs> I did wear some, I did wear shorts underneath it. So next time maybe I'll wear less. I don't know. We'll see, see how daring <laughs> it get. but it was very freeing. It was just kind of fun to wear it, you know? And, uh, uh, yeah, it was kind of cool. I, I got to find maybe a, a better color for me. But anyway, um, I just love what Chad's doing. And I, and it's been really super cool to be a part of that event. Um, and before that, I had gone to Chicago for the second Golden Con. And on both events, right. what's really so nice is that I get to meet the fans of the show. And most people come up to me and kind of apologize. I'm sorry to bother you. And I'm like, I'm, no, bother me. For a writer, it's very unusual for us to get to meet the people that watch our shows. You know, actors are known because of their faces. So people come up to them all the time and that you get feedback and get to hear stories. As a writer, you don't, if I didn't go to these events, I wouldn't get to meet people. And I've heard such beautiful stories. Uh, some, you know, have been really sad about people going through illness and have found that the Golden Girls got them through it. Um, others had these very special uh kind of weekly events with their grandparents or watching the show and even though their grandparents and usually it's the grandmother they may be politically on different sides they could all laugh at the same jokes and um that's really so so cool to be able to experience that years later after writing it um it, it's really special and i and i i love meeting everybody that's great. And I am so honored to know you. And I know you're approachable as heck. So it's not like uh, you're you're the standoffish kind of guy. I, but you know, the arms like, open all the time. It, it is very funny. Like people sometimes will, they won't talk to me the whole cruise. And then I get back home and they'll start, you know, DMing me. I'm like, why didn't you talk to me on the, on the cruise? Oh, I was, I was nervous. I'm like, well, you know me. I'm just, I'm just me. So there you go. And you recently went up to Orinda, California for a Golden Girls thing there. You and Alexander Rodriguez from On the Rocks radio show do this fun little talk back called, I believe it's what, On the Lanai? Or talk about that show. That's got to be kind of fun to share with people. Yeah, so we started it in Palm Springs at Oscars. It was called An Evening on the Lanai. Mm -hmm. And he starts the program off with some trivia games and showing clips of, of scenes and uh, some episodes I wrote. And then I come out and we do a, a talk back and a real spill the tea. And I answer everybody's question, and we have so much fun. And the show kept selling out in Palm Springs, so we kept doing it. Then we got asked to go um, to Pinehurst, North Carolina, and we did it at the theater there and just had a ball with it. And we would love to take it, you know, to Provincetown and Rehoboth and places like that and Fort Lauderdale. Um, but we just got to, you know, we just did Orinda, and that was super fun and, you know, some great old, as I say, pals and confidants from Golden Girls were there. Um, so it's always fun to meet up with a lot of these people. And I'm getting to meet actors that I've never met before, you know, that were on seasons after mine or writers that were mm -hmm. on the show. Like at Golden Con, I met Gail Parent, uh, who wrote a book called Sheila <laughs> Levine, is Dead and Living in New York. And that was actually the first uh, play that I kind of adapted illegally. And I got to, t when I was at <laughs> NYU, and I got to tell her, like, I'm, I tried to reach you and your agent from my dorm room. And she got a big kick out of that, but it, it was a, a beautiful full circle moment for me because she really inspired me to, to write. That's a very cool moment. I love that. Well, let's talk about your other girls, the Gilmore girls. You spend every uh, late fall, I guess, or early fall, late summer going to the convention in Connecticut. How did that go this year? And talk about how your, girl, your uh, Gilmore girls fans are and you still talk to miss patty to this day uh you guys have a, like a standing date i think don't you uh we do so um it's called the fan fest society and you can go to their website and it's every fall on the east coast and it's gonna be this september again in Algonquin, maine which we were last year and that's a beautiful part of the country and it's fall and the leaves are changing it's just gorgeous and a lot of the actors and crew all come back for that and that's been really just so wonderful and i've uh, got to meet these Zimmer fans and uh, this wonderful group of, of women and they've come to my events. They've come to, they came to Golden Con, the first one in Chicago. They came to Dallas for the world premiere of Silver Foxes 
And so we've really become more like family. That it's not like a fan thing. It's it's family. They they're so dear to me, and, and it means so much when they're there to support me. I, I can't even tell you without like getting too emotional about it. But it's it's so super cool. Um, so that they really built this great little society. But Liz Torres, who played Miss Patty, I really didn't get to know when I was writing for her on the show. And she ended up moving into the same uh, complex as my mom uh, before my mom passed, and uh, which is going to be two years. Yeah. Um, and uh, so every Monday I'd go see my mom and I would see Liz. And then finally Liz would just join us and we'd have, you know, talk the three of us. And she kept an eye on my mom when I wasn't around. And then when uh, my mom was in hospice there and dying, Liz like grabbed my arm and said, you can't leave me. So I go visit her every other Monday. Now I'm going to see her tomorrow. I love that. Yeah. And she's become a great friend. And I just, I adore her so, so much. Such a dear person. And the stories she has, I mean, like she's worked with everybody. I mean, she was really in there, you know, with the... Um, Norman, Who's talking? Norman okay. Lear. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then she did all these like cool variety shows back in the day. You know, I love those, you know, big splashy, you know, hour variety shows. And so I'll just like spit out names to her and then she'll just like tell me her experience. Like, Orson Welles, go. And it's just like these crazy <laughs> people. I'll, Lola Falana, you know, it doesn't matter who the name is. She'll have something where she'll have I've known them. Tab Hunter and I mean, just everybody. And uh, she's just become a dear, dear, dear friend. Um, and that's what's cool about these events. We, we, we reach a different level of friendship that we never would have had with, without uh, these wonderful events. Um, but the Fan Fest is not really a convention. It really is more of a weekend just hanging with people. It's not about selling products. You're literally, we're having dinners and just hanging out with, with all the fans together. That is awesome. Off topic for one second because you brought up Norman Lear. How great is it that Greg Cope's uh, Pink Marine is being adapted into a Netflix series and Norman Lear at 9,900 plus is, is producing it? How cool is that? We're very excited for him. And um, I got to meet Norman Lear finally. I felt like I can't believe my whole career. I'm never, ever going to meet him. And I went to a screening of uh, this super cool movie he made probably about a year and a half ago. And I was just like, gushing and then we're having I can't believe we're standing and having this talk about you know Liz Torres and all these people and uh, I mean he was so influential for me as a young person to watch that kind of television uh, right. because we had never seen something that was just uh, socially responsible brought up great topics and it really taught me a lot about provoking conversation through popular entertainment mm -hmm. and if you look at my work it's kind of what I've done and what I, I'm still doing, you know, with my TV work, especially with my theater work, that you can have a lot of, it doesn't have to be like this little, you know, small niche project. You can reach a, a large number of people, entertain, and still grow your heart. Right. Very much so. I just think that's so cool because he has been just producing such varied works in such marginalized communities to see him now back in an LGBT product. And Greg Cope White, if you haven't seen the book out there, guys, The Pink Marine, um, I'm so happy for him. He's been a good friend of the show. So I'm looking forward to that on Netflix. And they got a hottie little uh, lead actor there, too. So that's yes, kind of they fun. did. Yeah, I, I guess you've done a little uh, investigating online about him, huh? <laughs> When is he going to be on the show? <laughs> I kind of, I, I actually found him because I love the Netflix show Lock and Key, and he dated that lead guy for a while. I don't know if he still is or not, but uh, I kind of went down his rabbit hole then, and then saw him again. It's like, watch what you're casting. saying. Good on you. Rabbit hole. You better watch what you're saying. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> good catch. Good catch on that. All right, well, let's talk about your other girl for a second and, and go in the general contest because we went from Golden Girls to Gilmore Girls and you were on Roseanne and we've talked about this book forever. Uh, you're, you're, you're three girls. It seems like I'm seeing things happening there. Yes, talk I'm done about writing the project. it. I'm done writing Is it. Is there anything... I know you've been working hard on it, Stan. I just had... I, my question for you is... Is there anything surprising that's come out of it in your writing on it? 
uh, as you're bringing up these memories? Anything kind of interesting? Any stories to tell while you're writing it? Um, I didn't know. I didn't know I was going to end up with it being about my mother, really, and that she was my true golden mm -hmm. girl and my biggest fan and my best friend, really. Um, that was surprising. Uh, so I'm finished writing the book book. I mean, I didn't know like scripts, like you write a script and you're done and boom, it's, you know, it's on stage or you're filming it or something. This is a long process. Right. Um, so we got the book part of it. And then, so then they said, all right, now we want like 30 pictures. Well, I, I luckily was carrying around a little Instamatic camera everywhere I went. I have pictures from Golden I Girl. didn't know that. I, yeah. I mean, I have some people have never seen, like, I had a 30th birthday party and Estelle Getty I invited and she surprised me and showed up. I've never posted that picture anywhere. Um, wow. I don't think I posted the one when we were nominated for a Writers Guild Award and Rue McClanahan came to our table to wish us luck. Um, so those kind of really fun pictures. Well, I couldn't narrow it down to 30. So we got it down to like 70 and then like, help me here. And so I think I got it down to 45 area. So now they're kind of laying out where the pictures go and, and, and how it, the, you know, the text lands on the page. So we're hoping, knock on lots of wood, um, it's out for the end of the year, would be a great holiday, a little stocking stuffer. And um, it's, you know, a lot of, again, it comes, all my work, it's come from the heart. It's not bitchy and mean. It's just honestly how I felt at the time and the different viewpoints I have. So I've been keeping journals since college. So the idea I came up with is that I put the journal entries in from back in the day, and then I comment on what, how I feel about them today. So I had very different ideas of how I felt about Betty White back then to how I feel about her now. So, and as any, you know, we change, we grow, we mature, we see things differently. Sure. And so it's kind of cool to compare those two viewpoints within the book. And, uh, and, just the, and then the whole trajectory of being in the closet as a Hollywood writer to coming out of the closet. Um, and, and most people are kind of shocked to learn that we were in the closet on Golden Girls, even as progressive and as gay, you know, it felt we could not discuss who we really were when we were in the writer's room. Season I remember you talked about that before. Estelle was really the only one that let you kind of be yourself back then, if I remember correctly. Yes, yeah. So that, that happened. Years later, you know, there was Mark Cherry and people like that. And they've been, you know, Mark has been very, really good about acknowledging that my writing partner, uh, Jim Berg and me were, you know, kind of out there uh, breaking ground because there were no gay, openly gay comedy writers. You just didn't do that. When we were wanting to break into the business, I remember reading about Gary Marshall and all his shows. And they said that the writing staff would take breaks and go out and play basketball. And I was panic stricken. I can't do a basketball. How can we, like, can't they just hire us for our writing? We're going to have to be judged by our basketball playing great. Um, oh so luckily um, we didn't have to play basketball, but uh, you know, eventually, you know, we were one of the first people that came out uh, um, in a local paper here and, you know, our, our representatives, we're not very happy about it, but um, I think it opened a lot of doors and it just, you know, we felt free going to work then. We could talk about our, our real lives, and not have to hide. Well, I'm looking forward to the book. You've been birthing that baby for a while, but it's going to be worth it. I mean, it's uh, a lot of heart and soul of yours that got into it. We talked about it in front of and behind the scenes quite a few times. So I'm excited for you because I see, I can see that progression and I know how long and hard it's been for you. So that, and speaking of birth and babies, we do have to talk about Silver Foxes because that started back with Leslie Jordan and George Takei on the living room floor of that carpeting that I want so bad. <laughs> and then went through the script process and the uh, trying to be a pilot on TV. And then you and Jim, we did it as a play. So talk about that progressive and to finally see it happening this past year. Michael Urey, who's some, such a great friend of yours, helming it as a director. Talk about that full circle moment there, I bet. Well, it really is a lesson, and it's happened very much in my life, is just perseverance, sticking with something that you believe in. Because in this business, you get a lot of no's. And if 
you have to keep fighting again it's like i guess like politics as well so uh originally um it was logo that came to us and said we want you guys to write a gay golden girls we're like okay and uh, so we wrote this pilot and then because in the theater you usually have a a reading to kind of hear it out loud before you go and in, in, in put it up on its feet so i thought let's have a reading in my living room we'll invite the executives to my house which is never done who's who yeah yeah and so i cold called george Takei and leslie jordan i did not know them at all they didn't know me i said here's who i am the script is not even done instantly they were like what day what time will be there and we became really good friends with george Takei and just love him and brad so much and leslie's been great over you know it was that's why it was just so sad he was such a supporter of this project so we did the reading and then logo was like well we don't have the money to make a sitcom so then we tried to sell it to any other network major network streaming not one would open it and read it because it was old people and it was gay people pissed me off to no end um so we've been talking about doing this podcast and then talking with my friend Michael Yuri and like, well, let's make it as a play. Like, okay. So Jim and I got to work. We got it as a play. And uh, I got it to Uptown Players, which is an LGBTQ um, theater company outside in Dallas, which were Michael's from Dallas. So it was a perfect, again, putting all the pieces together. And he never directed a, he directed one person's play, but nothing like this. And a, a new play. And so... They came to a reading in my living room. We had Alex Mappa read one of the parts. We had a great cast. And uh, I think Jim J. Bullock. Yeah, we keep getting these great people. Anyway, so uh, this past March, we world premiered it in Dallas. And uh, Uptown Players was so wonderful, flying us in and out and being, being there and experiencing that event. And it was Theater in the Round. And it, it wasn't written for Theater in the Round. And at first we're like, oh no. But Michael came up with this great idea that the audience would come through the front door of the house. And we'd create, it takes place in Palm Springs. So we made like a little patio front porch, you know, with like the cactus and the, and the cool, you know, nice. modern fa furniture. And so the audience walked through and then the living room was just in there and then everybody sat around it. So every night I got to see the audience like directly into their faces. I had expected all the laughter. I didn't expect the tears. And so many, I saw so many lesbian and gay older couples touch each other and go like that. And they would come up to us after and crying and they would say, we're never, we're never heard or seen on stage and you gave us voice. And that's what just, and then there were a lot of straight people that were just laughing their heads off and really got to, Feel what these characters go through when you age. It's very different than when you're straight. It's just, and uh, and there's a lot of prejudice within the assisted living community towards us, and especially towards trans people. Think of that. So it just made us all realize that this play really has a life. You know that it can reach a lot of people, not just um, you know the queer community, but that it, it you know it's funny, but it gets people thinking about. Um, you know, and then it's just being old stuff, you know, the, the noises you make in the bathroom, the, you know, they, not just the bathroom, but all that funny stuff, of, <laughs> like just, you know, the sounds you make when you stand up or sit down or, um, you know, so it, it was a, a great event and we're looking forward to where the next step is with that production. Um, they're talking about possibly bringing it back to Dallas. We're talking with a bunch of different theaters across the United States that have asked to read the script or are interested. So what is the next step? Eventually, obviously, we'd love to get it to New York. Um, and of course, Palm Springs. Evolution Theater Company, Columbus, Ohio. They'll put it on for you. Guaranteed. Make, make the connection. I, I will make it happen. I will make it happen. And it's got to be kind of a two-edged sword for you, I would think, because one, it's not a series, so you can't continue the stories but also it's a play, so it's there forever. It's never gonna it's never not gonna be there anymore, right? So tell me about that feeling. Interestingly you said that. So Uptown Players said the whole time after it opened, they're like going, 
you know there's a sequel or, or a trilogy in this. I'm going, we're just doing the first one. So we're talking to them about, you know, maybe doing like a Silver Fox's Christmas or taking these guys and I would love to get them on a cruise, maybe a Golden Girls cruise, um, these characters in different storylines. So, you know, I'm just like catching my breath now, but we we're talking about possibly bringing Silver Foxes back in Dallas and then having the second show start in repertory with it. Like how fun would that be? That's exciting. And it reminds me, I don't know if you know the tuna plays, Greater Tuna. You ever see those? Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. So they've done multiple of those, those characters. So right. it's kind of in that vein could be fun. I love it. Well, yeah, eventually, eventually, I will get in touch with eventually, I will get in touch with Evolution Theater Company. We'll definitely get it done there. Evan. And we'll go from there. Let's we kind still, of go we it, well before you go, I, we still see it as a TV series. So this is kind of our back way way of getting it. Okay. That it becomes so popular as a play that that you know, the crazy people that make decisions will see that we've just got to get it on TV. And by the way, George Takei uh, plays one of the characters that you just hear a voice of on a phone. So he is in the show still, and God bless him. He, you know, he, he agreed to be a part of the play forever, really. I love that. He's doing such great plays now in London and everywhere else. So, I mean, yeah, that is awesome. Well, I love that. We'll have to keep uh, up on that because we're not going to spend so much time apart anymore here. No, we but can't. Let's go on to, we talked off air, what a busy year you've been. And you've always gone back and forth to New York, but you've spent a lot of time in New York this past year and a half. Let's talk about High Prob because that just, I just was so mad I couldn't get to New York to see that. What got your interest in that? Explain to my listeners what it is and what got your interest in that. Uh, actually, it's called hip prob, and it marries uh, uh, being hypnotized uh, and improv together. And uh, this wonderful hypnotist named Asad Meki out of uh, Canada came up with this idea, pitched it to Colin Mockery from whose line is it anyway, and he's, you know, a master at improv. So what the concept is, he hypnotized 20 uh, people come up from the audience, he hypnotizes them, he sends 15 back. Five, while they're hypnotized, do five improv sketches with Colin Mockery. Oh Crazy, gosh. right? Okay. So I'm in New York, and a very good friend of mine, uh, Cody Lassen, who's a big Broadway producer, um, the day before I was leaving on one trip, last April, he's like, I'm producing this play off-Broadway. Um, it was a big off-Broadway theater. Would you want to direct it? I'm like, yes, of course. And then I hear what it is. I'm going, how do you direct an improv show? Yeah. That's that was my first question when I saw it back in the day. Yeah. So, you know, they were really looking for a writer to come in and give it shape and give it some thoughts and then also give it a good look. And because I I mean you saw some plays I did in LA, I know how to produce, you know, for a little money and give you, you know, a big show. So but I had never worked with Broadway level set designers, lighting designers, sound designers in this huge theater that I had passed practically every day when I was an NYU student. So this was another full circle moment. I couldn't believe. I mean, I was in New York. It was like 120 on the subway. I didn't care. I'm just like sweating all over. But I was in New York doing what I loved. And we created a beautiful looking show. Um, so what we did with in rehearsals, uh, um, we worked out, we picked every sketch that they had been touring with it talked about it, you know, picked it apart. And then we had some people come in and we hypnotized them, but you could only hypnotize them once. And then we also worked on sketches and then went out to comedy clubs at night. So we'd be rehearsing during the day. Then at night we went to comedy clubs and we hypnotized audiences to try a sketch or two. And so the show was so successful. It got great reviews. I got a, a nice review in the Wall Street Journal of all places. And, um, it's about to open June 15th at Harris in Vegas. I'm going to, it's going to be a sit down That's show. Amazing. Like that was not on my bucket list of things to do. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I always thought that this show would be a great, uh, you know, show for that kind of audience in Vegas because you could bring, I mean, all ages can come see it. And it's just so fun. And the idea is when you're hypnotized, when you're, 
Colin explained this to me. When he does improvisations like on Who's Line with Wayne Brady, and he says something funny, he can see in Wayne Brady or Ryan Stiles' eyes, like, all right, what's the funniest thing I can say? When you're hypnotized, there's no thought there. It's just, boom. You just say the first thing out of your mouth. And that's what's so funny about it. And Colin responding to what you say makes it all the more funny. That's amazing. Oh, I hope I get to see if I'm in Vegas this summer. And would you go um, on, that would be would a lot of fun. Would you go on stage? Probably. Okay. I probably would. I don't know. I, that would be kind of fun. Yeah. I, we'll have to definitely make a date of that. Now, one thing I was surprised, I mean, you brought a lot of stuff through New York. You brought uh, um, your, your play, a lot of different plays, a lot of projects along the East Coast. I was surprised to see Stan Zimmerman starring in something. I've seen you talk about things. I've seen you do talkbacks. But Villain de Blanc starring Stan Zimmerman is one of the key marquees. Tell me about this experience, Mr. I won, Zimmerman. I by the way. So I, they had come to and heard about hip prog. And then they like, would you be in this on stage in this improvisation show? So it's, it's kind of like Mad Libs. And it's a murder mystery, and it's five, usually men and women, but they had all men. So there was, you know, some guys did play girl parts. And so it's kind of like Clue. And we asked the audience before the show, we run around all the tables, each one of us, and we asked for five or ten different answers. We put them in the script, and we don't read the script till we're sitting there. So I'm having to act the part, <laughs> putting in these Mad Lib things, and then they vote at the end who was the killer. And, of course, they voted me, so I won. Um, it was a lot of fun, and it was, you know what I learned from hip prop, which is uh, one of the key uh, rules in improv? You say yes and. If you right. say no in improv, right. it stops the improv. So just say yes right. and i got to get my tooth pulled because whatever you said. Um, so when things come in my life now, I just say yes and, and I show up. And so that's how I ended up on there. But I have been acting in Right Before I Go, and I got to do that in the East Coast tour, Five Cities, um, last right. fall with Gilmore Girl cast members and the wonderful Academy Award winning, uh, nominee, Virginia Madsen. And right. uh, that was in a very emotional, because uh, the play is about suicide. So doing that, you know, every day, doing it in one city, getting in a car, going to the next city, uh, but having the audience there and their reaction and knowing it's such an important topic, especially these days, uh, they really were so thrilled that we were um, having a, a safe place where we could discuss it. I bet. It's such a pause. We've talked about it in the past. It's such powerful performance, and, and you're. Uh, it, I know what it means to you and your family and everything, so I just... I love that it, it continues to go on because it's so needed, like we talked about earlier, in today's climate of things that are going on. People are feeling more hopeless than others, especially in our LGBTQ community. Um, but it was like banned. That, so so I, and I haven't talked that much about this because I promised the teacher uh, at the time I wouldn't talk about it. But I was set to do it um, last January at a certain university. And I've never said this publicly, but in the state of Florida. And they had bought the rights to the play. I was going to fly in and I was going to perform in it with university students, drama students. And at the last minute, their head of their mental health department stopped it. This person felt talking about suicide would create more suicide, which is the exact opposite. And uh, they also felt You're that... You're a mental health professional? Yeah, isn't that, isn't that... Yeah, that's really a good thing to hear. Um, and they also felt that I made too much of the LGBTQ experience because I have some letters from our community, right. which that's part of the story of suicide, unfortunately. Um, so that was that. really disappointing. But uh, when I started talking about it a little bit on social media, that opened up another door because some teacher from a school in Alabama called me. And said, would you come to Alabama? So I, there I was last summer in Alabama doing this play. Uh, and that community really needed to hear it. And that was it was so wonderful yeah. being there. 
I did not know that someone tried to block that. That is crazy. Let's go back real quick. We're going to start wrapping stuff up. I want to go back to Diary of Anne Frank because Colony Theater has been such a home to you. You've done so much great work there. Talk about being back in that space to begin with. And then we have this whole migrant situation happening this month or last month in May, uh, everything happening. Talk about the importance of this play and what keeps you motivated to do it. Um, and, and why do you think it's just staying relevant? Um, well, I started doing it in the 50 seat theater and then we went, uh, we did that twice. And then we were asked to do it at a, a theater festival in Vancouver, but the, colony it's a beautiful big it's 268 seats and just the way it's situated that you're looking down on the stage it's so gorgeous and they have a beautiful little balcony for the Anne Frank uh, scene in there um I have to do the play because when I was casting it and I cast this uh, beautiful 15 year old uh Latina actress and I said what grade did you read the book what do you think she said I don't know never I've not seen it Never. Not seen it. She didn't know who Anne Frank was. Oh my and then goodness! She looked it up and said, her mom, why are they having me read it <laughs> for the part? Because it was, you know, Latin, and then my whole concept, you know, that's what the concept is. Everyone in the attic are Latinx actors, um, and so she's been with the play for five years now, and she's so fantastic in it. And I think it's relevant because a lot of the kids come to this play. First of all, it's their first play they've ever seen. A lot of them see kids with their own skin color on stage, and then they hear the story. And because I find, you know, there are some laughs that I are in the play. You know, they're there. I, I of course, I bring them out. You can't have all these people in one room, like, without the fighting and some humor. But some people forget that Anne dies at the end. So they get to the end, and you literally, you hear gasping. And these kids and the kids start crying and it's very 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 intense and then i ended the curtain call music is um childish gambino's this is america because i want to bring it back around to this is happening here today wake up if you see injustice talk about it and that's why i bring the play back and we're continually doing it we've been asked to do it at a theater festival in south central la september 17th part of the uh, latino heritage uh, weekend, and it's going to be big street fairs, and we're the closing night show. So uh, we're really honored to be part of it and to keep Anne's story alive. That's great. And it's accepted by that community. Like you said, you have Jay Rodriguez doing talkbacks. You had Wilson Cruz involved, I think, in the producing side. So, I mean, that's just not to see that you have the acceptance of that community and they see the importance of it. That's got to just add to the gravitas of it, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and we've had the survivors. So the Jewish community, what's so great, we're all coming together to keep the story because unfortunately the Holocaust survivors are few and far between. And eventually it's just gonna be up to us to how we keep telling the story and how we keep reaching more people and, and, and different kinds of people. Right. I will have two more topics I wanna go over before we wrap things up here. The first is, I want to talk a little bit about this retreat that you had in the middle of the south of France. Thank you very much. I remember us talking before um, I stopped doing the show that it was going to happen, but it finally did happen. Talk about how that whole event came about and what is what. It's pretty intensive, right? It's, These guys get some one-on-one -on -one coaching. Uh, it's called Rocka Berity's Writers Retreat, and you can look it up online. And honestly, just because I scour Facebook every morning, I saw someone posting about it. And I'm like, wait a minute, a castle in France just sitting around talking about writing? I think that would be for me. And drinking wine, you know, who doesn't want to do that? So I wrote to them and I said, hey, would you want to have a Gilmore Girls writer there? And they jumped on that. And so for three years, because of COVID, we've had to keep pushing it off. And I finally got to do it this year. And there are four or five mentors for each uh, week-long program. And uh, we each get four writers, and we mentor them. And it's just a great exchange of, you know, being there, and they get to ask us all these questions, and we get to help them with their material. And then they've asked me back for next July. Um, so I'm going back to France in the castle. So, 
but they also go to Greece and they rent places in Italy. So I'm, I'm trying to work my way into those as well. That would be amazing. I did look at did a little research on it where you were there. You were sold out. It shows that you didn't have any opening in your people. Also, the guy that owns it, I thought was kind of intriguing. Uh, the producer of Sting. Let me find his name again here. Real Stuart, quick. Copeland. Um, Stuart Copeland. Stuart Copeland. Miles Copeland is Miles. the owner of that castle who uh, is a former manager of Sting and the Police. So that's kind of exciting. I just can imagine the little nooks and crannies of things you might have found in there. I'm not so telling that's you. Kind of... I, I felt like Maggie Smith running around there, judging everything. <laughs> I love it. All right, we'll have you back and talk about it one of these days. All right, and last thing we have to talk about, and we are taping this a little earlier than Pride Month, but we've had this writer strike happen. And this is your bread and butter. And I know that back in March, you and Jim had posted that you got a new gig. So I'm sure this has got to affect this gig that I'm sure you can't talk about. But I think it's very interesting because uh, I want you to give me your take on it. Because one of the main sticking points, I think, is AI um, that they won't even talk to you guys about. And everything I see about AI, it talks about old things. And everything in Hollywood, what's old is new again. It's repeat and repeat. So I can see where AI doesn't have an original idea in its body there. Talk about what your sticking points are for the writer's strike and what your thoughts about this entire thing. Uh, well, so we luckily got a job. It was, uh, you know, another decade that we were hired by a network uh, to write a big Lifetime Christmas movie uh, to star five divas from the 80s TV. I'll just let your mind try to guess who they are. I'm not going to say. Um, so we had to finish that by the, the deadline. So that was like, we had to write it really quickly. And we got the gig while we were doing Silver Foxes. So I was doing double duty, like theater at night, rewriting the play, then writing this movie. And uh, it, it was a lot, but it was very exciting. Um, so more for me than the AI part, which I, I definitely think is important to discuss, is and I think it's it's a bigger issue for the writers is finding a new way how we're paid. So in past years it was all like residuals. So like when I still get Golden Grove residuals, so every time it's aired, I get a check for that. Well now shows are not done like that. Like streaming companies will just buy it and you can watch it whenever you want. So we need to figure out a new way of payment for it. That's just, and, and every year in the past contracts, we've kind of like punted it. But now the world is mostly streaming. So there just has to be just a new formula. And it's just people sitting down and going, don't be greedy, but figure it out. <laughs> you just have right. to figure it out. And, you know, um, a lot of, you know, young new writers, they're really being hurt by this um, because there's smaller writers rooms. You know, on Roseanne, we had 21 writers. You know, right. and when you had the residuals, that was a big bucket, you know, and you could kind of knew how how much money was coming in and um, was streaming. It's a, it's a little murky, you know, because they just are buying. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, we got it's you talk about corporate greed and things like that as well. I mean, I just read something. I think the other day they took one series and I honestly can't remember what it is where they made. Uh, it was the one where uh, Bob loves Avishola. They left the two main characters as the featured actors, and put everyone else's recurring characters. So they only had to put them in five episodes to find a way to cut money. I mean, they're finding all sorts of ways to nickel and dimes, writers, actors, everybody. Or we've had and, where, uh, where they'll, they'll want free rewrites. They'll say, no, we didn't like this part of the, of your rewrite. So you got always another rewrite. We're like, no, that's not how it works. You hand it in, you give us notes, we'll address it again. But you don't get to pick it apart. And so they're always like, just one more draft, you know. Uh, and so it's just just be fair. We're not asking for the moon. Just be fair. Well, fingers crossed is one of this is resolved by the time this airs. But uh, it's got to be a scary time, like I said, for Hollywood in there. But you, my friend, you, you, can, you have so many – Irons in the fire that uh, you're, there's going to be no rest for the wicked for you. I'm I got to slow down Sorry and enjoy life and maybe take a vacation <laughs> one of these days. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Yes. 
Well, Stan Zimmerman, it's been way too long. I'm glad we caught up and we're going to keep uh, to our regular contact. I mean, we keep in touch on social media, but uh, we need to keep in touch just talking and sharing you with my listeners because I know what a genius you are and I need to share that with everybody else. So well, thank thanks, you. my friend, for coming back on the show. Bye. Let everyone know where they can find you on social media. Zimmerman Stan everywhere. And if you want to see one of the 9,000 things that Stan's done, you have your website still that gives just a glimpse. What's your website? It's also ZimmermanStan.com. And uh, I'm very approachable. Uh, DM me on Instagram. I love the Instagram. It's fun. It's, you can put pictures, videos, and uh, really sharing the story. Uh, a lot of people come up to me and say, they, it is a story, you know, and there's some sad moments, and I share those as well. Um, because I feel that's a part of life, but there's also a lot of happy moments. And then some angry ones when I see injustice in the world, I I will post about that as well. There you go. Stan Zimmerman, you know I love you. Thanks so much for being on the Left of Straight Show. Happy Pride Month to you. So we'll do a five questions with Stan next week, so be sure to look for that. We do that every Tuesday. If you're listening to Left of Straight Show right here on the Left of Straight Radio Network. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for listening to The Left of Straight Show. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distributor and please give us a five-star rating so more listeners can find us. You can follow us on social media and be sure to check out our website, www.leftofstraightradio.com for contests and other news and information. See you next week.